I'm Roland Griffiths. I'm a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm a psychopharmacologist, that is, I study the interaction of behaviorally active drugs and, and behavior. And I've been doing research preclinically and clinically for 40 years now at Hopkins. Uh, about 12 years ago, we initiated our studies, uh, human studies, with psilocybin. And that's been a really fascinating adventure to unfold. We actually initiated our studies in about 2000. The first couple of studies focused exclusively on volunteers, uh, healthy volunteers, uh, with, with no pathological conditions. And uh, the principal finding from those studies was that psilocybin, when administered under supported conditions to healthy volunteers who were well prepared for these sessions, occasioned experiences that really map on to the naturally occurring mystical type experience reported by religious figures uh, across the ages. That mystical experience, uh, um, although it sounds a little loosey-goosey, actually has been well defined by psychologists in the psychology of religion. And it is comprised of several features, a sense of the interconnectedness of all things, that's a unity, a sense of sacredness, a sense that the experience is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness, a sense of open-heartedness, love, positive mood, transcendence of time and space, and finally, uh, ineffability. People say, you know, I can't possibly put this experience into words. And so we were able to show quite rigorously uh, that psilocybin, high doses of psilocybin, can occasion experiences of this sort. When we give the psilocybin, it's to these well-prepared volunteers in an aesthetic living room-like environment in which they're laying on a couch. They have eye shades and headphones through which they listen to a program of, of music. We ask them to direct their attention inwards. And from that, the phenomenology of these experiences come out. And most people, uh, over it's about 60 to 70 percent, have these so-called complete mystical experiences. Now what's interesting about these experiences is that uh, not only are they very salient and compelling at the time that they occur, but on follow-up, people attribute um, uh, remarkable salience to the, continue to attribute remarkable salience to the experience, and in fact, rate them as among the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. So that's really quite, quite a remarkable metric and we've pushed people on what that means and they might compare the meaningfulness of this experience to say a birth of a firstborn child or a death of a parent. But these are big experiences. Not only do they have that level of salience, people are reporting long-term changes positive changes in attitudes, moods, and behaviors uh, due to these experiences. So there's a sense of uh, increased um, uh, self-awareness, uh, uh, increased sense of personal integration. Uh, people uh, feel less depressed or more buoyant uh, moods. A lot of pro-social kinds of attitudinal changes. People feel more of service to others. They feel more loving, compassionate, attentive, and sensitive. The, one of the questions that we asked immediately was, uh, well, are these people delusional? Are they just making this up? Would, would other people, in fact, endorse these kinds of changes that they're saying? And it turns out that they do. So we've done follow-up studies with community volunteers in, in this case, family members, friends, or colleagues at work who, when interviewed in a blind fashion with a telephone, will report changes that map on to what the volunteer reports. So these are, this is a really interesting phenomena. It, um, we think it looks like we're tapping into a basic biology of the human condition uh, that 
in which these salient experiences of interconnectedness um, emerge. And if you re really sit back and reflect on it in the kind of the history of, of humankind, those are the kinds of experiences that really form the bedrock foundation of most of the world's religions and the world's ethical and moral traditions. So we think we have a, a biological model for tapping into these kinds of transformative experiences. Um, and, uh, and now, as a scientist, um, we can do prospective studies. In other words, we can do planned studies in which we can occasion these kinds of experiences and then study all kinds of things. We can study reductionistically the neuroscience underpinnings of, of where in brain, what receptor systems, what neurotransmitter systems, what neural circuits are activated during experiences like this. We can study things like in uh, biological psychiatry about how personality factors interact with these kinds of experiences, or how genetics interact with these kinds of experiences, or whether intention or expectation interacts with these experiences. And finally, then there are our therapeutic applications uh, that, that can be focused upon. And we have a couple of trials running uh, with targeting therapeutic applications. One of those is uh, looking at uh, psychologically distressed cancer patients who are, have uh, either a terminal or a potentially life-threatening cancer diagnosis. They're dealing with the existential anxiety of that diagnosis and the implications. And the, th and the thought is that these kinds of mystical type experiences or experiences of profound insight may have uh, important therapeutic effects to, to people that are suffering with that kind of condition. And indeed, although the study is blinded, uh, our preliminary results uh, anecdotally would say that the experiences we're seeing map on to what we've seen with the healthy volunteers. And, that, and the fact that uh, we're getting a positive signal fits very nicely with older work done in the 50s and 60s, looking at mostly LSD and cancer patients. Uh, and then there was a recent study by Charlie Grove out of UCLA, it was just a pilot study, using a lower dose that was pointing in the same direction. So we think that's a very interesting prospect in terms of uh, developing uh, medical applications for these kinds of experiences. We have a second kind of therapeutic uh, program running right now. It's a pilot study investigating whether psilocybin uh, can facilitate cognitive behavior therapy for cigarette smoking cessation. So this is addiction treatment. And so that's interesting. It builds on Again, studies done in the 50s and 60s that looked at, again, mostly LSD and mostly treatment for alcoholism. But the question here is, can these insightful experiences, mystical type experiences, be leveraged and used uh, to um, occasion radical behavioral change? And so far, so good. We've run five volunteers. Most of our volunteers in the smoking pilot study remain completely abstinent. Uh, we don't have a control group yet, uh, but this is a, it's a very interesting application. And the, uh, the final application, therapeutic application, that we hope to start up in the near future is looking at psilocybin as a treatment uh, for uh, depressed patients who have been resistant to other forms of uh, antidepressant medication. And here, this is not really using psilocybin as an antidepressant per se, but the question is, would a reorganizational experience of this sort uh, alter fundamentally uh, the nature of the depressive episode and the nature of the depressive process? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's speculative, but potentially very interesting work, and it coincides with some recent work 
with a different kind of psychedelic, mechanistically very different, drug called ketamine that has been shown to uh, have efficacy in treatment resistant depressed patients. So we're now wondering whether that might be the case uh, and, uh, and we hope to exp initiate studies of that sort. In our work, uh, uh, people are encouraged really to have their own experience. They come into our session room, they put on eye shades, headphones, and, and we're not guiding these experiences in any uh, psycho classical psychotherapeutic uh, way. We're working with high doses of psilocybin. Now there are, in the history of working with substances like this, there have been a group of studies that have been done at lower doses of, with psychedelics in a context in which people are working with people therapeutically. That's not our model, but um, I should also say that our experiences are happening under a context and an, a, a setting condition with intentionality that really may fundamentally organize the nature of the experience and its effects. So for instance, in the uh, pilot study for uh, cigarette smoking cessation, the, people have these experiences, but uh, it's contextualized under conditions in which they have made a commitment to quit smoking on that day they have prepared their lives and, uh, and, and uh, followed a behavioral cognitive program right up to that point. And actually at the end of the session, we go through a ritual snuffing out of the last cigarette. So it's contextualized, but, but these experiences at high doses of psilocybin, frankly, can be so otherworldly, they can be so distorting uh, uh, that uh, we wouldn't want to presume to, to interact with people at a, at a conventional cognitive uh, level uh, during the peak of the experiences. Likewise, with the cancer patients, these people <laughs> are there because they, they're anxious because of their cancer. They have all kinds of existential questions, but although they may bring into the session uh, an intention to get clarity uh, about what, what's happening, we really invite them uh, uh, to give up any specific aspiration for the session other than to go in with radical curiosity and explore themselves and explore the nature of the experience that emerges from that. And we, and we actually believe that uh, people are best served by, by going in without an agenda to this kind of experience and being open to exploring whatever should come up. So in terms of my own involvement with this research, uh, about 17 years ago now, I initiated a regular meditation practice and that really perfect, uh, affected me very profoundly. It got me interested in the nature of spiritual transformation, the nature of spiritual experience. Um, it got me reading comparative uh, religious textbooks and diving into a literature that I actually had no business diving into as a psychopharmacologist. I do drug abuse pharmacology. And, um, and there was a curious period of time actually where I, I, I was really wondering how was I to engage in psychopharmacology? Here I am a drug abuse pharmacologist with an interest in core transformative experiences until, of course, I became reacquainted with this older literature suggesting that these compounds might occasion experiences that looked like mystical type experiences. I have to say that I went in uh, as a skeptic with respect to that. I had a meditation practice that was deeply fulfilling to me and I wasn't at all sure that, uh, that a pharmacological intervention would be useful in terms of, of uh, addressing some of those same kinds of issues. Um, but I had a, a grant to study 
uh, comparative pharmacology of various sedative hypnotics, and in this case, including a drug called ketamine, which is a, a different type of hallucinogen. And we, what we thought we would do is substitute psilocybin uh, in that study. We initiated it in healthy volunteers. We constructed the study such that um, if, it, if it didn't show anything interesting about spirituality or mystical experience, I could still go ahead and publish it as an interesting comparative pharmacology study. Um, but I have to say when we initiated uh, that study, and this was uh, when we initially thought about it, it was uh, the late 1990s, so it was probably 1997 when, when I first started thinking about this. Um, you know, the probability of getting approval for that, we judged to be very slim. My colleagues, frankly, a number of them discouraged me from doing it. They thought this was a little, uh, a little crazy on my part. Um, uh, these compounds, of course, had been so marginalized and demonized uh, due to what happened in the 1960s that uh, virtually no human research, and to my knowledge, no human research in healthy volunteers without prior exposure to these drugs had been done for over 30 years. And, um, and that approval process is a, is a tedious one. We have to go through the Food and Drug Administration, the Drug Enforcement Administration, much, much less we need to go through our own institution, in this case, Johns Hopkins, which is a first-rate institution, but there are also uh, plenty of smart people that are skeptical about whether this was a safe and prudent thing to do. Um, well, the good news is that we uh, persevered on that and, and eventually got all those approvals. I'm really proud of Johns Hopkins as an institution for rising to the occasion, putting aside what potentially could have been viewed as uh, institutional liability or institutional risk. You know, they don't want to raise the image of Timothy Leary at, at Johns Hopkins. But they put that aside, weighing what they believed and we, and we presented as the risk-benefit ratio. And, and, uh, and of course, the decision turned out to be the correct one. We now have run over 150 different volunteers, uh, over 350 sessions at Hopkins. We've never had uh, a, a really clinically significant adverse event. Um, so it's, it's really quite safe under conditions when people are very carefully selected, carefully prepared, and carefully monitored during the session. That's not to say these compounds are safe to use under unsupervised conditions or, or recreationally. I think there, there are a number of risks attached to them. So, so I got into this partly because my interest in meditation and because of that interest, we have pursued that line into meditation. We've just finished enrolling the 70th, 75th volunteer, the last volunteer, in what I think is going to be a very interesting study of the interaction of psilocybin uh, with people who are just making a beginning commitment to a meditation practice. So these are people who have never meditated before. Most of them have never had psilocybin before. And our thought is that there's potentially a convergence, an interaction between these two experiences. Both meditation and psilocybin are very different approaches to investigating the nature of mind, if you will, watching how the mind works, learning from that. And, and very often as you go deeply into those kinds of experiences, there emerge phenomenology that looks on the realm of spiritual or, or religious life. So we're pursuing that, and we also have hope to initiate in the very near future a second and related study investigating the effects of psilocybin in long-term meditators. These are people who we hope will have decades of experience uh, meditating. They'll be very good at introspecting on their inner states. And we're gonna look at how psilocybin uh, how they interpret the psilocybin within the context of their meditation practice. 
We're going to look at how psilocybin affects their meditation practice. And maybe most excitingly, we're going to actually give them uh, psilocybin during times that they're in an fMRI magnet. So we're going to be able to do neuroimaging studies and look at the effects of psilocybin on very selective tasks and, and, uh, and look at it on, on circuit connectivity within the brain in these long-term meditators. We picked psilocybin to study um, because it is one of the classic serotonergically mediated hallucinogens that are, were thought to produce these kinds of effects. So, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, which is uh, made from DMT, uh, and uh, mescaline are all naturally occurring serotonergic compounds. They're all, their pharmacology is all mediated through serotonin 2A receptors. Uh, LSD is a man-made classic hallucinogen, but it's, it's also mediated through that same receptor population. So the thought actually is that, um, although these studies haven't been done, that we could have picked any, any of those four compounds